Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today, we are going to talk about another important parallel pattern, prefix sum or scan. Before we go into the details of uh, prefix sum, let me very quickly uh, remind you what have been the parallel patterns that we have covered so far. We started with the reduction, an operation that reduces a set of values to a single value. It requires to use an um, um, associative, commutative, operator that also has an identity value, for example, sum, product, minimum, or maximum. And reduction is a, a key parallel, parallel primitive in, uh, for example, the map reduce programming model. Remember that uh, writing code for an efficient parallel reduction requires us to make sure that uh, we map uh, data to the uh, active threads in a divergence-free manner. If we do it that way, as the, iteration, the iterations make progress and threads start retiring, we will maintain uh, still uh, threads belonging to the same warp, all of them active. And this way we can maximize the warp utilization. This, this is key to obtain um, a high efficient parallel reduction. The second parallel pattern that we covered was a histogram calculation, a frequently used computation for reducing the dimensionality of uh, some data set and extracting notable features. Remember that in a, in a histogram, what we do is accessing elements in the uh, input and checking what's the value of this element. And based on that, uh, incrementing one counter associated with the bin of the histogram. In the parallel uh, implementation of histogram computation, we have to be really careful because there might be threads that are running concurrently and want to update the same positions, the same beams of the histogram at the same time. This is what happens, for example, in this, in this uh, particular figure where you see where that <clears throat> threads zero and three both read the uh, uh, same value, L, and both want to update the same element, the same being in the histogram. In order to avoid data races and make sure that the execution and the result is correct, we need to use atomic operations. The problem with atomic operations, as you may remember, is that they serialize the execution, so they can really um, affect the performance of our workloads. Uh, there are techniques to try to alleviate this overhead or this bottleneck by, for example, privatization. In privatization, what we do is replicating the histogram, creating multiple subhistograms, each of them assigned to the different thread blocks that are participating in the histogram calculation. Once the subhistograms are computed, they are, we are done with that, we reduce them in parallel and we obtain the final histogram that will reside in the global memory of a GPU, if we are using a GPU for this implementation, of course. The second, the, the, the next um, parallel primitive that we covered was uh, convolution, a widely used operation in signal processing, image processing, video processing, computer vision, and these days very much used as well in artificial intelligence and machine learning in convolutional neural networks. In convolution, what we do is applying a filter or a mask on each element of the input and obtain an output value that is the weighted sum of a set of neighboring input elements. And that's what we do, for example, in the 1D convolution, observe how we are applying here this mask on all the elements of the input array. And every time that we do so, we obtain partial products and then we have to reduce all these partial products in order to obtain the value that will go to the output array. And this is similar computation, but in this case for a 2D convolution. Remember as well that we, talk about the fact that uh, convolutional layers in, 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 in uh, convolutional neural networks are typically lower to matrix multiplication in today's GPUs. The reason is that GPUs are highly optimized for operations like matrix multiplication, and we can get the most of the uh, existing hardware uh, if we convert the um, uh, convolutions into matrix multiplications. And we discussed briefly this toy example that I guess it's um, quite clear about uh, how this um, uh, conversion is done. Okay, let's talk about the prefix sum, as I said, also called uh, a scan operation. Uh, prefix sum or a scan is an operation that takes an input array and an associative operator. Similar to the reduction, this associative operator can be a multiplication, addition, maximum, or minimum. The scan operation returns an output array that is the result of recursively applying the associative operator on the elements of the, of the input array. For example, if this is our input array that goes from x0 to xn minus 1, 
it has n elements in total and this is the associative operator for example the addition the output array from y0 to y n minus one um, is going to look like this if this is an exclusive scan or it's going to look like this if the output is an inclusive scan observe that the only difference between both is that the in the uh, inclusive scan we are also including in the operation the value corresponding to the specific index in this case i and observe that what we are doing is recursively applying the operator um, to the previous computation so I, uh, I, y, y i is equal to x0 plus x1 plus x2 plus until x i minus one and in case of inclusive scan is until element x i a scan uh, is a key parallel primitive, very much using uh, parallel computing, very much using in GPU computing that can convert recurrences from sequential. Observe this uh, for loop here where every iteration is dependent on the previous iteration into parallel. In this, uh, after performing the conversion, we can have a for all loop that gets the elements of the input, stores them in some uh, temporary variables, and then we perform the scan operation hopefully in parallel and we are going to see today how to perform this parallel scan operation a scan is a basic building block for many important parallel algorithms for example string compaction partition select unique radix sort quick sort etc you have a long list uh, here in this slide we are going to talk about some of these um, examples at the very end of this uh, presentation and let's see uh, like some uh, like one example of ex exclusive and inclusive scan with some uh, toy uh, representation of the input and the output arrays. This is our input array, <clears throat> and this is the operation that we uh, perform when we apply an exclusive scan on this input array. Observe that in the exclusive scan, what we're doing is in, uh, initializing the first element of the output array out zero to the identity value. In this case, the operator that we are using in this particular slide and in the rest of this lecture is going to be the addition. Um, so, uh, and as you see, uh, this is how we obtain each element of the output array by adding the previous element of the output array plus the previous element of the input array. In case of an exclusive scan, and this could be our uh, output array, and in the inclusive scan, what we are doing is initializing the first element of the output array to the first element of the input array, and then we perform the recursive addition, uh, but in this case, adding by the uh, adding the own element, the element corresponding uh, to um, the, the index that we are computing right now. So index i, uh, out i, uh, is using in i as, the, as one of the uh, input operands. And this is the output array that results uh, from this uh, inclusive scan. So we are going to, because as you see, there, there are, I mean, they are essentially the same inclusive, inclusive and exclusive scan. So we are going to uh, talk, focus now on how to implement the uh, inclusive scan on GPU. Uh, what we normally do in GPUs and also other parallel uh, machines is to apply a hierarchical uh, scan operation. In this case, what we do is first of all, dividing the uh, input array into equally sized chunks that are assigned to different thread blocks. In this particular case, we are using four thread blocks of four threads each. And uh, then for each of the, in, of the different thread blocks, we are going to launch, or for, for, for uh, all these input array, we are going to launch a first kernel that for each thread block is going to perform, if it's going to compute a partial scan operation. This partial scan operation is the per block inclusive scan. So as you see, this part of this um, output array here is obtained by applying the um, inclusive scan to these four elements, or this part of the array here is obtained by applying the uh, inclusive scan to these four elements. And But how do we go from this array of partial results to the final array, to the output array with the complete inclusive scan? One thing that we observe is that each element of the input uh, of the output array is obtained each element each let's say last element of each this chunk in this output array is obtained by adding uh, 
the uh, last element of the previous chunks after having performed this per block inclusive scan. For example, this 14 here is obtained by, by adding this 10 here and this four here. While this 20 here is obtained by adding this six plus four plus 10, or this 28 here is eight plus six plus four plus 10. So observe that in order to obtain uh, the correct output array, we have to take into account what are the last elements of the per block um, inclusive scan. And one more thing that you can see here is that this last element of each per block inclusive scan actually corresponds to the reduction result of the whole chunk. For example, this thing here is one plus two plus three plus four. This four here is one plus one plus one plus one. So uh, in the end, what we are doing here is uh, First of all, performing the per block inclusive scan, we obtain the last element of each um, of these chunks that have been assigned to the different thread blocks. And with these, um, let's say, partial reduction results, 10, 4, 6, and 8, we can create a new smaller array where we apply a scan operation on these partial sums. And then we can propagate these partial sums to the um, uh, partial results to the, uh, the output of the per block inclusive scan that is uh, copied here, this array here. So what we do is adding the uh, uh, partial sums, the, the, the scan partial sums to the corresponding chunk of this um, intermediate array. So for example, um, for these four elements here, we are going to add 10, for these four elements here, we add 14, and for these four elements here, we add 20. And this way, we obtain the output of the, the final output of the inclusive scan operation. So this is the hierarchical approach that we are going to follow uh, in this lecture. How do we uh, need to, how are we going to map these steps into the actual execution on the uh, GPU? So we are going to use GPU kernels, of course, but we may also need to involve the CPU. Let's see how. So first of all, we will launch one kernel that is going to compute the per block inclusive scan operations. Remember that thread blocks, in principle, cannot synchronize uh, within the same kernel. Uh, so in order to make sure that we have a coarse ring, a global synchronization um, after performing this per block inclusive scan, we need to terminate the kernel. And after that, we'll have to compute this scan of partial sums. We can do it in different ways. First of all, if this array is pretty small, what we can do is moving it to the CPU and then performing this partial scan operation um, in, on the CPU and then uh, return the um, a scan array of partial sums, return it to the GPU in order to uh, compute the final step, uh, the, the, this addition on the GPU side, or if this um, array of partial sums is relatively large, maybe we can scan it um, uh, on the GPU. So we could launch a new GPU kernel that would perform uh, this um, a scan of partial sums on the GPU. And then there is also a way of doing it using atomic operations in global memory. We are going to talk about this, about, uh, uh, about this at the very end of the lecture. So for now, let's assume that we either do this scan, this part scan of partial sums either on the CPU or with a new kernel on the uh, GPU. After that is done, then we have the, um, these um, uh, partial values, these scan values that we need to add to each of the uh, chunks of the uh, output array. <clears throat> so, uh, but now we have to see, or what we have to think about how to implement the first kernel, the per block inclusive scan. Inside a thread block, we can also apply a, hier a hierarchical approach involving warps and involving threads. Remember that thread blocks are decomposed into warps and when they are mapped to the GPU cores and they are the warps of 32 threads, start the execution in a fine grain multi-thread manner. So we are going to see how to do this per block inclusive scan using the warps that compose each of the thread blocks. And we are going to talk about two basic algorithms here. We will start with uh, Kogi's tongue, but we are, also going to, uh, we are also going to explain another important algorithm that is Brent Kong. So in Kogi's tongue, what we do is something like this. This is our 
uh, input array, observe that it has eight elements. So we are going to launch eight threads, or we are going to consider that um, our uh, thread block or our warp has eight threads. Um, in the very first iteration, observe that all threads, but the first one are active. And what they are doing is reading their own element and also reading the previous element, that one at distance one, and they perform one addition here and they store the partial result. We'll see where, maybe in, uh, in, in an array of intermediate results. In the next iteration, um, these two threads, uh, thread zero and thread one, are going to remain active, are going to remain idle, but the other threads remain active. And in this case, what they are doing is adding it, their own partial result to the previously calculated value that is a distance two. So you see one and two, we read this element and we perform this addition and we store the partial result here for this particular thread. We read this element, we also read this element, perform the <clears throat> addition and store the partial result. And in the next iteration, in this case, it's um, we uh, repeat exactly the same uh, partial additions, but in this case, at distance four. So we are adding this x0 to this partial result here from x1 to x4, and we obtain this um, partial result that we, well, actually it's, it's, it's going to be the final result for this particular example, we um, store it in the corresponding position. So as you see, most of the threads remain idle, only uh, a few threads um, retire every single iteration. In the first iteration, the first one is not performing addition. In the second iteration, the first two are not performing addition. In the third iteration, the first four are not performing addition, are inactive, let's say. And this is how the uh, code looks. This would be like the, let's say, most basic implementation of this code. Uh, remember that we are assigning one thread per input element and, 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 and per output element. The index is obtained by this uh, i, that is a, essentially the global uh, index of the thread ID based on the thread ID and the block ID. First thing that we do is reading the input elements, writing them to the output and synchronizing. Here, we are going to use this output array that in principle resides in global memory. We are going to use it also to store the partial results. And then we go to the for loop that, um, uh, that uh, I mean, essentially uh, allows us to execute uh, each of the successive iterations. Observe as well that the number of iterations is log n. If the uh, size of the input is n, the number of iterations is log n. So in, in, in the particular example uh, here, we have uh, eight elements in the input, and that's why we need three uh, iterations. And in every iteration, what we do is uh, 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 doubling this um, stride, first of all, a stride equal one, because in the very first iteration, each thread reads the, just the previous element, but in the next iteration, it will read the element at distance two, and then at distance four, and so on and so forth. That's why uh, after every iteration, we um, double the value of this stride. So first thing to do here is for those threads that remain active, those threads that are greater, their, their ID is greater of the or equal than this stride, we go to the output, uh, we read the element that is at the distance a stride, we store it in, them, in some uh, temporary variable, and now we have to synchronize. The reason why we have to synchronize is because we are using the output array also to store the partial results, and we don't want to override uh, any previously calculated partial results uh, when we uh, uh, perform this uh, addition here. So we have to make sure that all threads of the thread block have read the uh, previously calculated element. And, uh, and now, um, uh, now that it's saved in this uh, temporary variable v, uh, v, we can add it to the own element of the array, the element corresponding to uh, in position i corresponding to the uh, specific thread that is executing this kernel. After that, we write to the output, do we synchronize, and we can repeat um, the uh, 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 for I mean, we can repeat the, this loop body for the next iteration with a new value of a strike, of course. And after um, having uh, completed this for loop, the only thing that we have to do is writing the last element of this chunk to one uh, array of partial sums that we are going to use later in the second step of the um, hierarchical scan, scan, in the scan uh, of uh, partial sums, the scan of the short array, as you may remember. But let's uh, try to optimize this uh, code for Cogiston parallel scan. Uh, one observation here is that 
memory locations are reused. We are uh, essentially in the previous code we were using uh, uh, the output array to uh, store temporary uh, results, partial results, and we are reusing all those memory locations all the time. Because that's the case, what we can do here is using a buffer in shared memory, instead of go having to go to global memory all the time, we can uh, keep uh, the partial results in a buffer in shared memory, and this way reads and writes are, go are going to be much faster, uh, because we can access um, a shared memory in way less cycles than a global memory. So we modify your code in this case to use this buffer S that is this uh, array in uh, shared memory where we uh, essentially repeat the same computation but replace the uh, output array with this buffer S and now we perform the uh, successive iterations, log n iterations um, using the partial values, partial results that we uh, keep in this uh, buffer S here. Uh, but we can optimize even farther. Observe that here in every single iteration, we need to use two uh, sync threads. And in the end, uh, sync threads are barriers, so they are time consuming because uh, thread, so because warps that arrive there have to wait until all warps of the thread blocks have a right to that point. So they are inactive, and in the end, we are wasting cycles. So one way of getting rid of at least one of these sync threads is by using a technique that is called double buffering. In double buffering, what we do is using two buffers for temporary uh, storage, for temporary uh, results, buffer one and buffer two. We start using buffer one as the input and buffer two at, as the output, and we uh, uh, perform the successive iterations of the Cogistone algorithm. Um, in a normal way, the only thing is that after one iteration, what we do is swapping input and output, swapping buffer one and buffer two, such that the, um, input, uh, the, the input buffer for the next iteration is the output buffer of the uh, uh, previous iteration. And that's um, uh, essentially uh, how we um, apply double buffering to this uh, Cogistone algorithm. And here you see <clears throat> the resulting code. Observe that now we are declaring here two buffers of the same size, buffer one S, buffer two S, uh, we start using, in this case, the uh, in buffer is buffer one. We start using buffer one as the input buffer. We perform the first iteration with uh, this uh, input buffer, that is buffer one. After being done with this um, first iteration, we have to swap the pointers of uh, in buffer and out buffer such that buffer one uh, now uh, becomes the, um, so buffer one now becomes the, um, output buffer for the next iteration and buffer two becomes the input buffer for the next iteration. Good thing here is that now we can perform this uh, partial sum here without having to synchronize afterwards we, or, or we can actually read the elements from the buffer without having to synchronize because now we are using two buffers and we there's no possibility of overwriting values that need to be accessed or read by threads from other work. So, uh, with this uh, double buffering technique, we save one sync thread, and for sure we achieve some uh, additional performance improvement. Now let's uh, analyze a little bit this uh, Cogistone algorithm, and let's talk about work efficiency. We say that a parallel algorithm is work efficient if it performs the same amount of work as the corresponding sequential algorithm. As we have seen before, uh, the sequential algorithm, algorithm of SCAM or prefix sum requires n operations, right? Um, so the work efficiency of the sequential scan is uh, n. We just need to uh, perform one more addition for every new element of the output that we want to calculate. But let's take a look about how many uh, additions uh, Cogistone requires. So if uh, you look at this um, figure on the right hand side, you see that the number of steps is log n. So for example, um, in this figure, we have uh, eight elements, so we need three steps. And the number of additions that we perform um, in each step is n minus two to the power of a step. Uh, that essentially means that in the very first iteration, we are performing not eight, but seven additions here because um, it's uh, step zero. So uh, two to the power of zero is one. So instead of 
performing eight additions, n minus one, eight minus one is seven. In the next iteration, we have a step one, so it's m minus two operations. So here we are uh, uh, performing six additions. In the next step, we have four additions, as you see. So this is all total, and we can <clears throat> finally obtain that the complexity of this uh, cohistone algorithm is n log n. So those are the that's the order of magnitude of operations that we have to um, execute for cohistone. Observe that the algorithm is not uh, work efficient, um, essentially because it's uh, performing more operations than the sequential scan that only requires uh, in operation. So, if the resources are limited for and in, in, for the in the in the hardware uh, on which we execute this parallel algorithm, this parallel algorithm will be slow because of the uh, low work efficiency. Because in the end, we are uh, executing more additions, more operations than the operations in the uh, sequential scan. But let's take a look about the, at the other algorithm that we mentioned before, Brent Cone. In, uh, this uh, <clears throat> operates in a similar manner, but it requires more steps, as you see. And the very first iteration, uh, one thread, we assign one thread uh, every two elements. So here, observe that only threads one, three, five, and seven are active, and they perform one addition here, one here, one here, one here. So it's four additions. In the next iteration, uh, there are only two active threads, in this case, thread seven and thread three, and they are performing one addition each. And in the last iteration uh, of this step of the algorithm, um, we have only a single active thread, in this case, is thread uh, seven that performs this addition here. This is what we call the reduction step of the Brent Cone algorithm. And now, after that, we have another. Um, uh, another step that is called post-reduction. And in this case, uh, we somehow operate the other way around. We start with only a single thread. In this case, it's um, thread five that is performing this partial addition here. In the next step, we have three active threads, the uh, even number threads, uh, zero, uh, sorry, two, four, and six perform one addition each. This is the post-reduction step. So let's discuss what's the work efficiency of uh, Brent Kong. But first of all, recall that the work efficiency of Kogiston or the complexity of Kogiston is n log n. In Brent Kong, we have to, first of all, count what's the number of operations, the number of additions that we need in the reduction step, and observe that, first of all, the number uh, of steps in the reduction step is log n, and the number of operations here is, uh, is uh, 4, is two is one. So we are um, uh, essentially uh, performing, it's uh, one operation in the last, uh, one addition in the last step of the reduction step, two additions in the previous one, four additions um, in the previous one, and so on and so forth. So in total, this is n minus one operations. And in the post reduction step, in this case, we have uh, log n minus one steps, as you see, and the number of uh, operations in this in, in each step is one first, then it's uh, three, um, then would be five, and so on and so forth. So it's two minus one, it's four minus one, uh, and so on and so forth. So in total, this is um, n minus two minus log n minus one. So if we add these two numbers, we have in total two log n minus one steps, and in total is O n. So this is the, the, the final number that is in the order of magnitude of n. So it's uh, the complexity here is, um, is O n. And as you see, this is work efficient, right? It's uh, because um, it's uh, essentially the same number of additions that we needed in the sequential scan. So Brent Kong takes more steps than Kogiston, but is more work efficient. So if we execute this in a parallel machine with uh, limited resources, we could expect that Brent Cone will perform faster than <clears throat> Kogiston. But the reality, at least on GPUs, is that while uh, Brent Cone has higher theoretical work efficiency than Kogiston, in practice, its actual resource consumption on the GPUs um, is, uh, is worse after accounting for the inactive threads. And that essentially happens because remember GPUs are 
parallel multi-thread machines, they execute warps, and these warps uh, execute run in last step. What that means is that all threads of the warp are scheduled at the same time. And those uh, threads are mapped onto CMD lanes. And those CMD lanes are there. And if we really want to uh, get the most of our hardware, we have to maximize the utilization of those CMD lanes. We discussed this um, uh, in, with a lot of detail when we covered the parallel reduction that we uh, reminded in the very beginning of this lecture. And that's something to take into account when we uh, implement a parallel algorithm on uh, GPU. If you observe the different steps in Kogiston and the different steps, successive steps um, in Brentcom, what you see is that the utilization here in each step is uh, always higher than the utilization in these steps here. For example, even in the very first step, already half of the threads of the warp are going to be idle, right? Um, so um, uh, what uh, we can expect here is that in reality, Cogiston is going to be more uh, efficient, it's going to be faster uh, on GPUs than uh, Brent Kong, because uh, Brent Kong, if we take into account the idle threads, um, in the end, is wasting uh, execution cycles. But it's still, it's, uh, I think, really interesting to compare these two algorithms, because this can also um, help us to reason uh, in future implementation of probably other algorithms as well. So now let's uh, go a little bit further and see how we can optimize the per block inclusive scan that we were discussing. Remember that in the per block inclusive scan, one thing I mentioned is that um, for the per block, we are also going to make use of a hierarchical approach. And um, in, in this hierarchical approach, we need to involve warps and threads. If there are warps involved, then it's important to uh, keep in mind that we can use warp shuffle, instru warp shuffle instructions or functions that are a very efficient way of uh, exchanging data across threads belonging to the uh, same warp, as you may remember. Here you have this um, slide uh, for you to recall. And recall as well that we are going to apply this uh, hierarchical scan as well to the per block uh, inclusive scan. So from this, hierarchical scan that is the uh, initial figure where we have uh, we started to discuss now we can apply let's say the same approach to the per block um, inclusive scan where now we divide the chunk of data that was assigned to each thread block we can divide it uh, over the um, warps that compose this thread block so first step will be performing a per warp inclusive scan Every single warp is assigned a few elements. So we perform a per warp inclusive scan here. When it comes to the point where we need to synchronize, now because all these warp, <clears throat> all, <clears throat> sorry, all these warps belong to the same thread block, they can synchronize using sync threads. And um, then we can have typically one of, of these warps will perform the scan of partial sums and then they will synchronize again and perform the final addition. So let's see how we do this uh, per warp inclusive scan. And here is uh, how the code looks. Um, of course, first of all, we define what's the warp size is 32 in current NVIDIA GPUs um, uh, here, because this is a warp based uh, execution. We need to make use of the lane ID that is a thread index inside the warp and the warp ID that is a warp index inside the thread block. And, um, and this is the device function uh, that we create to uh, perform this warp scan. So first of all, uh, each uh, input element, has, so each um, uh, thread has its own input element that is here in val, we, we copy it to this variable x, and now we perform um, the uh, successive iterations of uh, Cogistone, that is the algorithm that we are implementing here uh, by, um, by, uh, with this for loop and by using shuffle uh, instructions. This shuffle app sync that allows each of the active threads, uh, as you see, uh, for example, for this thread one here, to read the element to move from a lower indexed uh, lane uh, to, the, to, the, to the own uh, lane. Uh, that th those elements that are at a distance offset. So in the very first iteration of this for loop, the offset is equal one. So thread one reads element zero, uh, thread two reads element from lane one, and so on and so forth. 
And um, if the thread is uh, indeed active, we perform the uh, addition. So this is the uh, warp scan operation that is uh, extremely um, efficient thanks to the use of the uh, shuffle instructions. But now we know how to implement the warp scan operation or how to do the uh, per warp inclusive scan. Now let's see how the complete per block kernel uh, will look like. Uh, in this case, this uh, block scan operation, we need to use some uh, shared memory array as data to store partial results. Very first thing to do is to uh, call the warp scan um, uh, function that we have in the previous slide in order to perform this uh, per warp inclusive scan. This way we obtain a warp uh, prefix uh, that we store in uh, shared memory. In particular, the last uh, thread of the warp is lane ID equal warp size minus one. So the last thread of the warp uh, is uh, storing the, uh, re the, the reduction result 10, 4, 6, and 8 into the shared memory array. And then we synchronize for one warp to perform the uh, scan of partial sum. So this scan operation here in the second step is now executed by a single uh, warp is, um, it's a, in this case, is warp zero. So because it, here uh, we are going to involve only those threads with an index uh, less than warp size. So from zero to 31, we perform the warp scan operation on the values, on the elements that we uh, stored previously in shared memory. So um, we obtain this scan, uh, scan array of partial sums, then we synchronize, and then we, we can perform the uh, final addition as, um, as we have to do in this last step. And everything is in the same kernel as you can see. This is the uh, per block hierarchical scan. And these, this hierarchical scan that we are applying at a GPU level, let's say, and at a block level as well, is what we call the scan scan add approach. I think it's obvious the reason why we call it this way, because first of all, first step is a scan operation. Second step is also scan operation. In the last step, we just need to uh, add uh, the, the, the elements of the um, scanned uh, partial sums uh, to the uh, results of the per block uh, scan, right? So this is why it's a, a scan, scan, app. And is it uh, an efficient algorithm? I think it looks like an efficient algorithm and we have actually discussed how to optimize it, but um, let's take a closer look and think about how many global memory accesses we need uh, for this algorithm. And it's important to look at the global memory accesses because in the end is the most time consuming operation that we can execute on a GPU, accessing the data in global memory, especially if we have to access very long arrays of N elements. Let's assume that uh, we have N elements in our input array. And in the very first kernel, in the scan kernel, what we do is uh, uh, we, we, we read uh, the, the whole input array of N elements and we perform the per block prefix sums, and then we have to store back um, these um, uh, partial results, these uh, per block per, uh, prefix sums um, onto the global memory, into the global memory again. So in the end, in the first kernel, we are reading n elements and we are writing n elements to global memory. In the second step, uh, second kernel, regardless of whether it's executed on the GPU or on the CPU, this is much smaller because in the end, uh, this um, intermediate array of uh, partial sums is uh, pretty short, is only n over block size elements. So probably uh, pretty small compared to the uh, input and the output arrays. So we can ignore that, we can consider it negligible. Uh, but uh, uh, finally, in the add kernel, in this uh, final operation here, we have to read the whole array of uh, per block prefix sums that we computed in the first kernel. We have to add, uh, and, uh, perform the additions, and finally write uh, the output element. So we are again reading any elements and writing any elements. So in total and in summary, here we are reading four n elements, uh, either read or written to global memory. And that's of course uh, pretty expensive, if, especially if the arrays are very, very long. So let's try to optimize this uh, approach. Let's try to come up with a more efficient approach this more efficient approach is what we call reduce scan scan. And what we do here is that in the very first kernel, the only thing that we have to calculate is the uh, 
per block reduction. Remember that that's what we need to synchronize and go to the second step, that is the scan of partial sums. So in the very first kernel, we are going to just calculate the per block reduction. Second step, we scan the array of partial sums. And in the last step, we take the input array as is. And now we are going to perform the per block scan and the uh, final additions. This per block scan and the addition can be performed, can be executed in the same uh, kernel. Now, if we look at the global memory accesses of this reduce scan scan approach, in the reduce um, step, we need to read the whole input array of n elements, but we only need to write one element per block, which is negligible. In the uh, second step, scan operation, we only operate on a small array of partial sums, so we consider it negligible as well. And in the last step, we have the large scan per block uh, or per block scan, uh, where we uh, have to read the whole input array, and then we have to write the final output array, both of n elements. This is in total three n elements that are read or written from global memory. And if you compare this to the scan scan add approach, we are reading way less elements in this case. We, only, um, we, are, uh, uh, we are only reading three n elements uh, versus four n elements in scan scan add. Uh, it's interesting to compare these uh, two approaches and actually not only on GPUs, but also in other parallel architectures. And one example of this is the admin PIM architecture um, that uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a CMD machine, but it all, it's also a fine grain multi-thread machine where we have uh, different cores uh, called DPUs or DRAM processing unit. And these DPUs execute threads that are called casklets. And these threads can synchronize either using handshakes or using uh, variers. They can also use uh, mutexes as we mentioned in a previous lecture. In this architecture, we have actually compared uh, these two approaches, SSA and RSS. And one thing that we observe, and it's uh, actually quite intuitive, is that for very small, very uh, short uh, arrays, uh, scan SSA uh, is faster than RSS because even though we have to access more uh, the memory, but we are saving the synchronization primitives that we have to use in the first step of RSS in the uh, reduction step, because in reduction, as you know from all reduction lecture, uh, we have to synchronize threads uh, from time to time. And that synchronization in the admin PIM architecture is uh, quite time consuming, and, um, and, that, um, and that makes that the uh, SSA approach is faster than the RSS approach for very small arrays. As you see, as the array size increases, then at some point the uh, RSS uh, version starts being faster. You can find all the details in uh, uh, our uh, paper. Uh, something like this is what we can expect as a behavior on GPUs as well. So um, uh, most typically we will use the RSS approach to implement a fast scan operation on GPUs. And actually we can write very efficient uh, reduction kernel because we already know how to do it. We uh, discussed a few lectures ago how to implement an efficient uh, reduce kernel uh, where we made use, remember, of the warp shuffle instructions as well um, in order to, uh, to have a fast communication across the threads of the same warp. So after performing the reduction tree in shared memory, uh, remember that we synchronize and then we will have a single warp operating performing the final uh, reduction and this final reduction can be um, accelerated using the uh, warp shuffle instructions. We also discussed in, in that lecture that um, there are now since the Ampere architecture compute capability uh, 8.x, uh, there is native support for warp wide uh, reduction operations. And uh, remember that we saw how to replace this um, for loop that we have here with a single instruction reduce at sync that can perform the reduction operation natively at the warp level. And uh, by doing so, we can probably um, accelerate even more this uh, reduction kernel. 
we don't really know the, how these um, reduce, native reduce operation is implemented, but one possible way is uh, the, the, the way that I'm to describe next. Um, as you uh, may know, and as you may imagine, this is a GPU core. Inside the GPU core, we have multiple processing engines. These processing engines are essentially the CMD lanes where we execute arithmetic operations like 32-bit um, floating point or uh, integers or, or, or double precision, et cetera. For these processing engines to access data, we need to use a crossbar unit. This crossbar unit is going to bring to, bring to the processing engines data residing either, either in shared memory or in the local register file, as you see here, but also um, the crossbar unit communicates to the processing engines instructions and other data that resides in different memories. For example, this parameter memory um, is uh, similar to the constant memory that we have uh, also discussed in the uh, previous in a previous lecture. So let's take a closer look at this crossbar unit. Inside this crossbar unit, we actually have the configurable crossbar that are the uh, connections that can go from here to there. So for example, for uh, the different processing engines to access elements in the uh, in registers, in the local register file. Uh, so we have to configure the crossbar uh, in a way that we route from this input to the corresponding output, right? And this is all controlled by a crossbar controller. So this is how, um, and, and let's say, a basic crossbar unit looks like. But now we can extend this uh, crossbar unit by adding a reduction operation unit. And this reduction operation could be useful to accelerate um, uh, reduction operations, such as the uh, warp uh, reduce instructions that um, we have, uh, we are um, discussing and we have mentioned before. Um, so how does this uh, crossbar, how is this crossbar going to be configured to allow us to perform um, efficient reductions using this uh, reduction operation unit? So let's take a look at this uh, conceptual diagram. Remember, in a reduction operation, we need to perform uh, log. So if we have an input of n elements, we need to perform log n steps. So in this particular example, we, we see um, 16 elements. So in total, we will need uh, four steps. So here we have one, two, three, four. These are the different steps. And in each step, what we do by using the core crossbar controller is configuring the uh, crossbar in the desired way to move data from one lane to a different lane, perform uh, partial additions in this reduction operation unit, and then writing the partial results into the registers that will be accessed in the next uh, level, in the next uh, iteration of the uh, reduction. So for example, at the very beginning, let's take a look at these uh, two lanes, lane zero and lane one. Each of them have uh, their own uh, element assigned from the uh, input array. And what we do is just swapping these elements, moving them to the other, to the, to the neighbor lane in order to perform partial addition. So uh, the value that is uh, handled by lane zero is moved to lane one, in order to perform one addition here, the value in lane one is moved to lane zero in order to perform one addition here and obtain some partial results. And we are going to do exactly the same for the rest of uh, elements, the rest of lanes. When we go to the next step, now instead of swapping uh, two adjacent elements, what we do is um, uh, swapping pairs of elements. So these two elements uh, in lane zero and one, these two uh, actually previously calculated partial sums in the previous iteration, um, uh, these two in lanes zero and one are going to be, be moved to lanes two and three, and these two in lanes two and three are going to be moved in lanes zero and one. So this is what we do, and we obtain more uh, partial sums, partial results in this uh, second iteration. We do the same for the rest of lanes as well. In the next level, um, now it's not two elements, it's uh, four consecutive elements that are swapped with the next four consecutive elements. As you see, we perform the partial additions here and there. And finally, it's uh, eight elements. So elements um, uh, in lanes from zero to seven are moved to lanes eight to 15, and we perform the uh, final additions here. And we, after this, will obtain the uh, reduction result. 
And this is uh, actually what we are going to see in more detail in, in some examples. Uh, the only important thing to take into account is that um, we have to be careful about using invalid values. Remember actually that in the warp reduced native instruction, there is a mask and this mask defines what are the actual threads of the warps of the warp that are active. Some of the threads might be idle or maybe simply we create the mask in a way that uh, we don't want to involve all threads of the warp. So there will be, or it's likely that there will be um, inactive threads uh, in each warp. And if there are inactive threads, uh, their, their corresponding value is invalid. And uh, it doesn't really make sense to use it, right? And what would happen if we uh, are not uh, aware of that and we don't take care of that is that one single invalid value can will propagate over these um, uh, the successive iterations and will uh, corrupt the results. So that's something that we need to avoid. And in order to do so, the uh, crossbar controller has this uh, procedure here that now we are going to um, and to um, study. We are going to uh, learn and and see uh, how this uh, reduction operation can be performed by skipping the invalid values. Let's start with the very first lane. Lane zero um, is in charge of this uh, element seven. Lane zero needs to select, first of all, what's the math input. This math input means the value corresponding to the lane that is, uh, let's say, paired with, these, um, uh, with uh, each lane at every single step. So in the very first iteration, uh, lane zero needs to go to lane one or needs to check with lane one and read its element and bring it uh, here to perform the uh, addition, right? This eight is seven plus one, as you can see. So after selecting the map input, in this case for lane zero is lane one is this element here. After selecting the map input, we have to check if this uh, source lane is disabled or not. In this case, it's not disabled. We have a a value, a correct, we have a, a valid value here in lane one, so it's not disabled. We will go through this path here and we will perform the uh, reduction operation. We'll perform the, the addition. Now, if we take a look at the uh, next lane, in this case, lane one, the selected uh, mapped input is coming from lane zero. So again, this one is not disabled, so we can perform uh, the addition. But now what happens here is that this guy is uh, indeed um, uh, disabled. This, this, this is not a valid value, but in reality is not a problem because what we have to worry about is the um, select math, uh, math uh, input. And this um, uh, math input for lane two is coming from lane three, as you see. The only thing that is going to happen because this lane three is not disabled is that the result will be uh, incorrect, of course, it will be invalid, but uh, in reality is not a problem for now. The problem might come here when we focus on these uh, lane three and lane three because the uh, map input is coming from or should come from uh, lane two. And in this case, it's uh, actually disabled, right? And when it's disabled, because this lane two is disabled, what we have to do is looking at the partners. What are the partners? Depending on the level, we consider partners uh, a few of the neighbors. So for example, in this first level, partner is only one other uh, lane. While in the next iteration, we will see that partners are all these four lanes here and all these four lanes here. But now, for now, are in, we are in this iteration. So are the partners disabled? And yes, all, all partners of this lane three are disabled because the only partner is lane two and lane two is uh, disabled. So the only thing that we can do is going through this alternative path where we change the operator, we change the addition to a move operation in order to just copy uh, the input, the value from the input uh, to the output. We perform the move operation, Good thing here is that we avoid the addition that could corrupt this result as we saw in the previous slide. <clears throat> For the rest of uh, elements in, uh, in, the, uh, in this iteration, we uh, operate normally. Uh, now, uh, when it comes to uh, the next level, um, uh, first of all, again, we start with these uh, 
lane zero, if we check what's the math input of lane zero, uh, it's uh, in this uh, step would be lane two. But remember, observe that in lane two, we have an element that is, or we have a, a lane two is disabled. So we have an invalid value uh, here in lane two. So we cannot go this way. We have to check uh, the partners. Good thing is that now partner is uh, this other lane, lane three that contains value two. So we can simply uh, read the element uh, from lane three and bring it here uh, to lane zero and perform the addition and obtain uh, the uh, correct result. And that's what we are uh, doing here. We are routing a partner to the output. We are routing these two uh, from lane three to lane zero, and we can perform this uh, addition and obtain uh, the correct result. And we um, uh, will uh, operate in a similar way for the rest of the elements in this level. And then we can go to the next level and observe that also to calculate these 23 here, in principle, the selected partner uh, would be this one or the selected lane would be this one. But because this one is disabled, we have to go to a neighbor, to another, to a partner, and we root the value that contains the partner. In this case, it's 10. 10 plus 13 equal 23. And this way, this way, we obtain a correct result in all those lanes that are really active. And the um, reduction result is 23, uh, as you see on the slide. But this is a configurable crossbar, right? So if it's a configurable crossbar, this means that we can configure it in different ways by just, uh, 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 by just having the uh, controller um, uh, activating the corresponding lanes and the corresponding connections as they are needed. And one thing we could do is, for example, um, I, again, having uh, four different steps, four different levels. In the very first level, as you see, we only have uh, half of the threads are active, half of the lanes are active in this uh, case, one, three, five, seven, and so on and so forth. And each for each of them, we are getting the uh, value from the previous um, lane at distance one, so uh, we can, for example, perform one addition here. Uh, this element from lane one plus the element from lane zero, we obtain some partial result. We can do the same in lane three, lane five, and so on and so forth. In the next level, one connection uh, we could do is uh, having, in this case, uh, lanes two and three are active, and they both read from the same source from lane one and perform some partial, addi partial additions. Same here for lanes six and seven, 10, 11, 14, 15. And in the next iteration, now we have four active lanes here, four to seven. They all are reading from uh, the previous uh, lane, lane three. And in this case, for lanes uh, 12 to 15, they are reading from lane 11. And finally, in the very last step, the last eight elements are updated with the value coming from lane seven. We can have a similar procedure here in order to uh, escape the uh, corrupt values as well, like the, these x here or the invalid values, because, for example, the corresponding thread is not, not active. And, um, and um, so we have to, for the active lanes that are 1, 3, 5, and 7, we have to select the map inputs that are coming from lane 0, 2, 4, and 6. And we perform these. Uh, partial additions here, because none of them are disabled. There's no problem. We can route um, the map input to the output and perform the uh, sum, perform the uh, reduction operation. Uh, but now for these two elements here, uh, all, all, uh, um, uh, now for these two elements here, we have to go to uh, lane one and, and bring, bring this element. This element is not disable. So again, we can uh, route the, the input to the output and perform the additions. Also the same for these two elements here. We read from lane five in this case. And now in the very last step is where we actually have the, uh, the, the source is uh, disabled. So we have to uh, check um, uh, the, the neighbors in the opposite dire direction, opposite direction meaning to the left. And we say it's opposite because as you see, the values are propagated to the right. So we have to go to the left and find what's the first neighbor that is not, um, uh, that is not uh, disabled. In this case, lane two with this 
13 here, so we can route uh, these 13 uh, from lane two to lanes uh, four, five, seven, and six, and perform the uh, final additions. And if you look at the result, and if you see what we have done here is a prefix sum operation. So we can uh, implement a prefix sum, or we can execute a prefix sum operation natively by using a crossbar unit like this one with this uh, reduction operation and with this configurable crossbar. So I think that this um, native prefix sum doesn't exist yet um, in, um, um, like in, in CUDA, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, it appears uh, at, at some point, same as the uh, warp reduce instruction up here. So recall, uh, we could replace, or we could maybe in future architectures, we could see that this uh, warp scan would be even further optimized by replacing this uh, for loop with the shuffle instruction with just a single native uh, warp scan instruction. So this is our uh, reduced scan scan. We are approaching the end of the lecture and this is uh, almost a summary of what we have seen so far. Remember that we apply a hierarchical approach where, where first of all, we perform either a scan per block scan or a per block reduction. We have already explained as well that the reduced scan scan approach is hopefully uh, preferable because uh, it, um, it doesn't need to uh, go to global memory so frequently. It doesn't need to read or write so many elements from uh, global memory. So we have this uh, per block reduction after the first kernel per block reduction. We need some interblock synchronization. This can be done as we explained before with kernel termination and then scanning on the CPU or launching a new scan kernel on the GPU. Or we could also um, do this interblock synchronization Take, making use of um, atomic operations in global memory. And let's see how we can do this. This is what we call the adjacent block synchronization. It's a technique that we call the uh, adjacent block synchronization. And it can save even further accesses to the uh, global memory, as we are going to see. For this um, interblock synchronization, we are going to use atomic operations, as I said. And it's going to happen exactly at this point, exactly at the point where the per block, um, so the per block reduction has been done. Uh, we need to see how we synchronize across consecutive thread blocks. Per block, so per block reduction happens exactly uh, in the same kernel, but exactly before these uh, adjacent block synchronization that we, we are going to explain now. And observe that first of all, the this um, block synchronization is uh, controlled by a single thread. In this case, thread zero in each uh, thread block. So once we uh, arrive to this point, the thread zero is going to uh, do this uh, BC waiting, this uh, while loop that is going atomic uh, to, to, to check uh, some uh, variable, some uh, uh, position, some particular element in an array of flags. So it's uh, checking all the time by uh, using an atomic add. It's not really performing any add because it's just adding zero. So we want to see if this uh, a, a corresponding flag has been set by the uh, previous thread block or not. And while uh, this is uh, still zero, we continue with the BC waiting. At some point, the previous thread block sets this flag in the, in the array of flags. And so we uh, get out of this uh, while loop here. And at that point, um, the thread, uh, thread zero, can go to another array that resides as well in uh, global memory. Uh, and read uh, one element from this array in global memory. In reality, this array in global memory is same as uh, this array of uh, partial sums, of scanned partial sums uh, that you see here. So for example, if you are um, at block zero, you will read this element. If you are block one, you will read this element and so on and so forth. So that's what we are reading. Um, uh, from uh, the global memory, and then we propagate the partial sum. Observe that what we are doing is adding the previous sum to the local sum that was obtained before in the per block reduction, um, and we write to the next element of the array of partial sum. So in the end, what we are doing here is performing the scan operation. Right after that, we just need to use these thread friends in order to make sure that uh, we uh, respect the uh, memory consistency. And, uh, and right after that, once the, after the thread friends, we are sure that this uh, scan value uh, VID plus one is already in global memory. So we can set the next flag for the next thread block uh, 
to perform the adjacent block synchronization, perform these uh, partial sum and continue the execution. What will happen after this is that we perform the per block scan operation. Remember um, that we are talking here about reduce scan scan. So after performing the adjacent block synchronization that is uh, naturally or inherently um, executing the intermediate scan operation, we have to uh, execute, we have to perform the last step that is the per block scan, um, including the addition in the uh, reduce scan scan approach. But there is uh, one uh, important consideration here to take into account and to make sure that our code works correctly is that remember that uh, there is no guarantee about how thread blocks are scheduled on the hardware. So they may not be scheduled in accordance to their block ID. This is something that the thread block scheduler decides and we don't really have control on this and we don't really know how these may change from architecture generation to architecture generation. So in order to deal with uh, this issue, what we do is uh, creating a dynamic block ID that is obtained at the very beginning of the kernel. Observe that this is as simple as having a global counter that is accessed by one thread of all thread blocks. We just uh, increment this counter, obtain this uh, pseudo block ID or this virtual block ID, this dynamic block ID, and then uh, it's shared uh, with all other threads because the, it's placed in, in the shared memory synchronization, then all threads can read this dynamic block ID from global memory and from shared memory. And then at that point, start using this uh, BID in the rest of the kernel. Um, for the data that they need to access from, to, from global memory, for the flags that they need to update in this adjacent block synchronization, and so on and so forth. Great advantage of the adjacent block synchronization is that it reduces the global memory accesses from 3N or 4N in the case of uh, SSA uh, to only uh, two memory accesses, uh, to, or, uh, to, to only two accesses to the um, uh, whole input array or the whole output array. So in total, two in elements only are read or uh, written to uh, global memory. And everything happens inside the same kernel, uh, reduction step, adjacent block synchronization, per block scan step, uh, just uh, everything in, in, the, in the same kernel with just n elements read at the beginning, n elements written at the end, and um, in a much faster way as the traditional approach. Um, still, the issue here is that we need to use atomic operations. We have to be careful uh, with memory consistency using these uh, uh, memory fans. And in the end, atomic operations are uh, costly, as you know. But hopefully, in um, upcoming architectures, hopefully in the next uh, uh, NVIDIA architecture, H100, uh, this may be uh, even more efficient because now there is a direct uh, communication from thread block to thread block when they reside in the same cluster, uh, thanks to these uh, SM to SM or GPU core to GPU core uh, network. I still don't know how this will have to be implemented, but probably uh, we will be able to create a more efficient uh, JSON block uh, synchronization. Okay, we are uh, closing to the end, uh, so we are uh, getting close to the end. Um, let's uh, very briefly recap on what are the app uh, applications of prefix sum or scan. Remember that the scan is a key parallel primitive that is used in many important parallel algorithms like string compaction, partition, select, um, sort uh, algorithms, and, and so on. We uh, ourselves were experimenting with uh, different of these algorithms in, in a previous work. There, uh, we created implementations of a, an important class of algorithms that we call data sliding because they move data in uh, one direction. And among these data sliding algorithms, um, we have padding and padding, string compaction, select, unique, partitioning, um, et cetera. For you, uh, for, uh, for you to have an example, let me talk about uh, select. It's essentially an operation where we are filtering or removing elements from an input array uh, based on a certain uh, predicate. In this case, the predicate is true if it's even. So uh, we partition the input array across the available thread blocks, block uh, from zero to two in this case. And now uh, we write to the output, uh, in this case, those elements that are uh, odd. Uh, we are uh, 
remove, we are moving to the output element one, element three, here from here, element one, element three, and final from the last flop, uh, element one. This is an operation that can be implemented by using a scan, as you can imagine, because the place, exact place that where we write the uh, output elements of a particular block depends on the output elements, the number of output elements of the previous blocks. So this block two, this block one needs to know that this block zero is writing only two elements to the output. And that can be communicated by using the adjacent block synchronization that is inherently performing a, a scan operation as you have seen before. By using this technique, uh, we uh, compare uh, back then with a state-of-the-art GPU uh, compared to the existing implementation of this select algorithm and the thrust library, and we obtained like around three times uh, a speed up thanks to the fact that we were using uh, the adjacent block synchronization and saving accesses to uh, global memory. You can learn much more about um, a scan operation and, and also about the adjacent block synchronization in this uh, chapter eight of the uh, book, um, Programming Massively Parallel Processors. This is all for today. I hope that you found the lecture interesting and I also hope to uh, see you soon in the uh, next lecture of our uh, course on Ethereum systems. Thank you very much for your attention.